what I'm going to talk to you about this evening is, as was mentioned, some of the recent testing that we've been doing on the extensive sculpture collection in the Met. And I should maybe brag just a little bit and say that I'm able to do this and give you this talk because the Metropolitan Museum of Art supports both a scientific research department and an objects conservation department. So I have access to people whose interest in art is often based on materials and techniques. Most of this work I did with a woman named Donna Strahan, who has abandoned me to go to be the head of the scientific research lab at the Freer Sackler, but I have forgiven her. So we will be talking about materials that can be tested. So I will begin with bronze and then go to wood. And interestingly enough, this ties in with some of the things that Natalie has been saying about collecting and also some of the points that Pierre was making. So we're going to begin our talk with a large gilt bronze sculpture of the Buddha Maitreya, which is dated by inscription to the year 486 and was clearly some kind of an imperial commission because it re refers to the Dowager Empress Wenming who was the most powerful woman in China in the late 5th century. It was, it is, I have this in centimeters, I'm very proud of myself, 140 and a half centimeters high. So it's absolutely the largest and most spectacular Chinese Buddha sculpture from the late 5th century known anywhere in the world. Because it's the largest and most spectacular Chinese Buddha sculpture from the late 5th century, known anywhere in the world. It has also been, over time, very controversial. It was acquired by the museum in 1926 as a masterpiece. Um, someone then wrote an article suggesting that maybe it was a late 19th century copy of a masterpiece, and its status plummeted. Um, and Don and I, when we studied it, realized that both from the testing of the alloy the kind of gilding that's on the top of it, the fact that there are traces of paint, and more importantly, how it was made, that it is indeed a masterpiece from the late fifth century. Um, and the interesting way is how it was made, because it was made in a technique that is not the lost wax technique, which is the way most bronzes are cast, but in fact something called the piece mold technique. And this is a distinctively Chinese technique. It can be traced back to the Great Bronze Age of China. So we're in the Shang and the Zhou dynasties. And essentially how this technique works is that you have molds that are in pieces that are made of clay that are then assembled together to allow for the casting of the sculpture. Once we discovered that this was, in fact, the piece mold technique, it made perfect sense that it would be an early Chinese Buddhist sculpture. So if you can imagine this Indian religion of Buddhism coming into China with its entirely different visual vocabulary, its entirely different visual iconography, and as was true in Southeast Asia, probably small portable things being brought as models, you can see that Chinese craftsmen would, of course, try to make things that looked like their prototypes, but using a technology that they knew very well. So it makes sense that this was piece mold casting and that this is in fact relatively early. So the implications of this for us in our study of the Mets collection were twofold. One, we realized that this much smaller piece that came in in 1974 um, and is 16.5 centimeters um, and had never been shown was also a totally great, well not great, but a, a, a real and an actual thing. It probably dates earlier than the Maitreya we are talking about, sort of late fifth or early, late fourth or early fifth century. It has a peculiar inscription on it, which must have been later, but just like our great masterpiece, it is made using the piece mold method. And if you study the casting flaws and the casting technology, you can determine that there were probably, in this case, two piece molds. One of the most important things to come out of this research was an understanding of this wonderful sculpture, which is unfortunately not at the Met, it's at Harvard, um, which is also a late 4th or early 5th century Chinese sculpture. Unlike the Met's piece, which has very much a Chinese face and a Chinese treatment of the body, this particular piece looks to many people to be more Gandharan. So it would have been made in Pakistan, 
um, in, the, in the area that used to be called Gandhara, possibly because of the treatment of the face, because of the mustache, and because of the flames that are coming out around the shoulders. However, this was also peace mold cast. So therefore, since only China, and I guess at some points a little bit of Southeast Asia, used the peace mold casting tradition, this also has to be a Chinese Buddhist sculpture, just one that is closer to its Indic prototypes. Um, so other testing has made us just reassemble some of our pieces in different ways. So we're looking again at a piece dedicated to the Buddha Maitreya, again, because this is China and we have inscriptions dated to 524. And if you look very carefully at this magnificent sculpture, you'll see that there's a beautiful filigreed halo which is surrounded by music-making angels known as apsaras. On either side of it, there are four, two standing bodhisattvas, two seated bodhisattvas, four donors, there are lions, there are guardians, and there's this wonderful little lotus-shaped thing here, which actually opens up and was probably a reliquary. And now in this sculpture, there are these two small monks. And the reason this is interesting is because the two small monks actually came in on another sculpture of the same type. It's again probably dated to Maitreya. It doesn't have an inscription. It's probably 10 years later than our slightly larger piece. Um, and they were always shown as being on this piece. However, when we tested the copper alloy, that was used to make the two pieces, we found out that the copper alloy on the earlier piece, dated to 524, is slightly later than the copper, different than the copper alloy on the smaller piece, and that the monks themselves match the alloy of the larger altarpiece perfectly. So at the moment, our second altarpiece is somewhat denuded, but still very, very beautiful. And of course, the question is, why did this happen? because both of these pieces came in in 1938. They were given to us as gifts by a Mrs. Rockefeller, Mrs. Abby Aldrich Rockefeller. As I'm sure many of you know, American museums often build their collections through gifts from patrons. She had bought them from a Japanese dealer named Yamanaka. And so the question is, did Yamanaka, who somehow got these very unusual and rare altarpieces, again, there's still nothing like this known in China, kind of look at them and decide that maybe the smaller one was a little too bland for the market and just kind of pick the little figures up and move them over to the larger altarpiece? Was there some kind of a mistake made in shipping? Why did it happen? We don't actually know, but it's very interesting to speculate. Um, the th third piece I'm going to talk to you about is dates to the late 7th or early 8th century. It's 27, 20 centimeters high. It is widely acknowledged as one of the masterpieces of the Tang Dynasty in our collection. It's extraordinarily beautifully cast, cast bronze Buddha. By this point, we are in the lost wax technique. So as far as Donna and I can figure out, the piece mold casting may be lasted until the mid 6th century. Um, the two altarpieces that I just showed you are half piece mold, half lost cast. But by the 7th or the 8th century, probably due to renewed contacts with the sub subcontinent, lost wax casting had become the norm for the making of Buddhist sculptures in China. Because of the, the mudra that he's showing, the particular variant of the teaching, turning of the wheel mudra, I suspect this might be a very early representation of Vairachana, who is one of the deities most easily associated with the rise of what I'm going to loosely call esoteric Buddhism. Um, and if you can see from the back, this sculpture also once probably had a fairly elaborate halo, which is now missing. Um, X-rays of the sculpture show that there were cavities, which you can see in the head and in the body, that were open. So it's possible that at some point in its history, this had consecratory material in it. But perhaps the most interesting aspect of the sculpture is in fact what you see when you turn it and look at the bottom. And as you can see, there's this sort of wheel-like structure with six spokes on the bottom of this Buddhist sculpture. And that near the spokes, there are also kind of little notches where things might have fit in. And the question is, what was this all about? <laughs> 
So we started out by thinking that it must have been some kind of a casting device. And Donna and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out why either technically or structurally this sculpture of a Buddha would need this kind of a spoky wheelie thing in the bottom. What we realized is that there was no technical reason for this to exist, which led us to think it might have had some kind of iconographic function or meaning. And my best guess, and I should tell you right now that this is absolute speculation, I made it up, is that maybe this was intended for lotuses. So this is a reconstruction of what it would have looked like if there were six very, very large lotuses. And if that's correct, then essentially what's going on here is the first example known anywhere in the world, definitely bragging about the Met today, by the way, um, of this type of thing, which we find in India in the 11th or 12th century, and this is actually a Tibetan example from the 14th or 15th century, and these are three-dimensional mandalas. So essentially what happens is that the lotus petals can close up and hide the primary icon, which is the Buddha in the center, and then they can open up again. So that they're these very dramatic functional sculptures. If the one in the mat is in fact of that type, which would explain the wheel spoky things on the bottom, then it's the earliest known example in the world. I should say that I don't think this is a Chinese invention in terms of iconography. This is probably something that happened in the Indian world. But it's also worth noting that the style of the Chinese Buddha, and in fact the style of the late 7th or early 8th century, was very, very much influenced, in my opinion, specifically by Kashmir, which was a major Buddhist center at that point in time. And which um, is, it's also the style that's called the International Tang style and spread throughout all of Southeast Asia. Testing of alloys, looking at how things were made, just really looking at things very, very carefully, has also led us to attribute several of the sculptures in the collection to different parts of the world. So on your left right now, you're looking at something that's probably very familiar to all of you and should look like the things my colleague Pierre was just talking about. It's actually from southwest China, from an independent kingdom known as the Dali Kingdom, um, it's in, which would have been in Yunnan province, and it's a, the classic icon for the Dali Kingdom. It's sometimes called the Luck of Yunnan. It's a bodhisattva. Again, it's the bodhisattva with the Buddha in the headdress, known as Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, Guanyin in Chinese. The slide on your right, on the other hand, is something that until very recently we attributed to the northeast of China. And that is because of the fact that it's wearing a crown. And we often find comparable but not similar crowns associated with the Liao people, who were a nomadic group that, um, or I should say the Qidan people, the Kitan people, who were a nomadic group that established the Liao dynasty. However, the chemical alloy of the seated bodhisattva, again Avalokiteshvara, in, or Guanyin, in this case with a thousand hands, not literally, but that's what it's supposed to be, is exactly the same as that of the Yunnanese Buddha. And after years of thinking that this was a northeastern sculpture, when I found out that the chemical alloy was exactly the same, and I looked at the face, and I compared it to the face of the already known to be Yunnanese Buddha, I realized, in fact, that this beautiful sculpture, which we've had for many, many years, was probably from the Dali Kingdom as well. And as we continued to test, we found out lots of interesting things. Perhaps the most important, or the most surprising, is um, illustrated by the adept-like figure that is on your right, um, which was acquired by the museum maybe only about 20 years ago and was considered to be Nepalese. Now you have to imagine, if you're going to compare it to the, the bodhisattva that is gilded, that this could have been gilded as well. But the alloy, the arsenical leaded bronze, is exactly the same as that of all the Yunnanese sculptures. So again, when you start looking at things with a different piece of knowledge in your head, we had to consider the fact that the adept was not Nepalese, but also probably from Yunnan. And it is true that in Yunnan, and so far only in Yunnan, 
that's where you find this kind of bizarre thing where someone is holding a partial sword next to their head. And so if you imagine that that sword would have been real, it would be, you should be reading it as going right through their skull. The other thing that's very, very interesting, again, when you've got different kinds of knowledge in your hand, is that this particular bracelet, or sorry, necklace, is almost exactly the same as this necklace over here. So again, probably something that was made in Yunnan, which leads to the rather interesting question of exactly who this figure is. Um, clearly, he's an adept of some type. This would be the very, very, very beginning of a Tibetan tradition, or I should say a tradition we associate more with the Himalayas, of having great adepts, or Mahasiddhas, people that are quasi-historical beings and contributed to the development of esoteric Buddhism. But my little figure doesn't fit into the standard iconography of any of the great Mahasiddhas as we know it in later Tibetan art. Although it's always possible that there was a tremendous amount of fluidity as traditions and practices evolved. The single most distinctive feature of this sculpture is that you in fact have a Vajra popping out of the chest, which is unique. And if you look through Tibetan literary sources, you can see that there are two people that are said to have Vajras popping out of their chest. One is Pagma Drupa who lived from 1110 to 1170, and the second is his disciple, whose name I've forgotten to write down. Um, and the story is that as Pagma Drupa was dying, the Vajra that was in his chest, that sort of symbolized his advanced practices, went from his chest to that of his disciple. Yunnan is not that far from the Himalayas. It is in the west of China, as I wrote. Respected, and it seems to me quite likely that they knew about this great Tibetan master and the Vajra in his chest. Um, turning to wood, the piece that I'm showing you on your left is in fact, is that your left? Yes, um, in the Metz collection, and the two pieces that I'm showing you on your right are in the Royal Ontario Museum and are dated to 1195. And when I first looked at the Metz piece, what I thought of was these Royal Ontario Museum pieces because they share several features. Um, they're frontal. The Royal Ontario Museum one has more elaborate headdresses, but they're still pretty much the same. They both have relatively simple jewelry. The sculptures, particularly mine and this one, both wear this very, very unusual garment which is actually tied at the shoulder with something that looks like a belt strap and a buckle. They both have garments that cover the front of the shoulders, and in both cases, the garment itself tends to sort of fall over the upper torso or the abdomen. At the same time, they both wear, all three of them wear this very, very elaborate sash over their, their sort of undergarments. So they're having these sarong-like undergarments, and then in the center, they have this very thick, elaborate sash that falls all the way down. So I thought mine was pretty much in the same time period, pretty much the same thing. Oh, and then we did two things. We hired a scholar from Japan to help us identify the wood, and he discovered that our piece was foxglove. Um, and we did a carbon-14 test, and the carbon-14 test on mine came out to 810 to 1010 AD. So what exactly do I make of that? Because that means that my piece is significantly older than these famous dated pieces in the Royal Ontario Museum. And what I am making of that in the, at the moment is that perhaps what happened in Chinese Buddhist art is that there were local or regional workshops, sort of very, very specific ateliers that continued to work in a certain style, regardless of time period, so although at the moment the tendency with Chinese art in general is to talk about things in terms of dynasties or rulers and to say this is Tang, this is Song, this is Liao, this is Jin, it may be that that's a little done just a little too strongly and that you had these very localized workshops that developed a style for religious imagery which is always conservative because you just don't mess around with how, what your god should look like, that's dangerous, that then continue to make the same kinds of sculptures 
over and over again for centuries, regardless of who their patrons were or who their rulers were. Um, and I think that's beginning to have in interesting implications. So I should say, and I wish I'd seen these before, that you have two great 12th century sculptures in this museum, both of which are on view. Um, and when I looked at them very carefully, I realized that like the three I'm showing you here, they're probably from Shanxi province, but from a different workshop, because they look more like each other and another piece in my collection than they look like these three. So moving from Shanxi, which is north central China, a bit into the northeast, um, I'm looking at a sculpture that is dated to the 11th century and is made of willow. Again, this is the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara or Guanyin. Um, in this case, it is a single block of wood, which is interesting because some of the sculptures are single blocks of wood and other sculptures are multiple pieces of wood pot together. Um, the hands are separate, so it's not entirely a single block of wood. Um, it's Avalokiteshvara resting in his particular paradise, which is Potalika. Um, and it was probably made for a nomadic people because it actually has this fantastic belt, which is sort of plaques of what were probably in metal of some sort, gold or silver, or perhaps bronze, a type of ornament that we associate with people who have nomadic roots. What was particularly interesting about this when we x-rayed it, however, is that there's a mirror stuck in the middle of it. So, it, and this is the part where I say you can't see it, but you have to trust me, but it's a darker circle in here, and it's quite big. It's probably about this big in proportion to the sculpture itself. Which leads to an interesting question. Why is there a mirror in the Buddhist sculpture? And in fact, in the Met, we have two that have mirrors in them. The piece I'm showing you, and one of our more famous masterpieces that is dated by inscription to 1282, and also made of willow. So you see the sculpture from the front. You see it from the back, and you can see that there's a plate at the back that's been removed. And when you take that back plate out and turn it around, you get the inscription that gives you the date, and you can see that a mirror has been stuck in the middle of the sculpture. OK. So I think why is a really good question. And here are my speculations du jour. Um, mirrors play always and historically a far more important role in Chinese sculpture than just as cosmetic devices. They're magical and they're protective. Mirrors also appear as a metaphor in Buddhist writings very, very early on. So one of the first scriptures to be translated into Chinese is in fact the mirror of the law or the Dharma. So the mirror of Buddhism. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, in the Tang Dynasty, at about the same time that our Mandala Buddha was being made, a monk named Fadzang did a very, very interesting experiment where he created a hall of mirrors to sh explain to a ruler what the idea of inter interdependence and interpenetrability in Buddhism means. That having been said, however, it doesn't seem to be until the period between the 9th and the 14th century that mirrors appear in a significant role in Chinese Buddhist art. And so the question is, why? So I started by looking around for other sculptures that have mirrors in them. I should say that I think that there are probably many more. And once everybody uh, x-rays their sculptures, they'll find out. But at the moment, the only one that I could find is a Chinese Buddha sculpture made around 985 of sandalwood, which is one of the most famous icons in the Serioji in Japan. And it was not only a mirror in this case. This particular sculpture had a great many things in it, including silk organs and all kinds of other fun stuff. Going back to China then, since I couldn't find any more sculptures, I discovered that in the period that we're talking about, mirrors do seem to have worked themselves as some kind of atropophaic, very meaningful, quasi-magical imagery into many, many aspects of Chinese culture. So I'm showing you here a pagoda from Inner Mongolia that is decorated with 856 mirrors, some around, some triangle, triangular on the exterior. If you go back a little earlier in time to another pagoda, that at Famansu in Xi'an, and I'm showing you the underground crypt, 
the room that had the reliquary, which is this chamber right here, had on the ceiling, uh, exactly above the reliquary, a gilt bronze lotus, which had the mirror in the middle of it. Um, and then, again, in exactly the same part of China where I, my two sculptures were made of willow, which are like the northeast, there's a ton, well not a ton, but a significant number of tombs <coughs> that also have mirrors, excuse me. Okay, I'm gonna be the first and only one to drink the water. <laughs> also have mirrors in the decoration. So this is the tomb of Zhang Wenzhou, who died in 1093. And he was a Buddhist. And because he was a Buddhist, he had himself cremated. And then his remains were placed into a mannequin. And the mannequin was placed into this chest. And the chest is actually de uh, <coughs> decorated with Sanskrit sayings, sort of pithy little magical phrases that are known as Durrani. And as was true at Famensa, directly above his, crema, his reliquary, I guess, or his, well, not a coffin, but whatever, his urn, his funerary urn, or his chamber with his things, there was a domed ceiling. And in the middle of this ceiling, there was a lotus. And suspended by a rope from that ceiling, there was a mirror that would have dangled over his, his remains, which had already been consecrated with the Durrani sayings. And in fact, in all of these tombs, or in many of these tombs, you find this kind of device, where there's a lotus um, with a mirror coming down on a string to sort of mark the most important part of the tomb, which is usually where the cremated remains of the inhabitant of the tomb are. And if you look at the area surrounding that particular lotus, you'll see that in every, almost every case, there's also a significant amount of astronomical symbolism, such as the eight stems. So this is sort of the cosmos and the stars from a Chinese perspective, which you also see here. And then as you know, the Chinese also have kind of the, the, you know, the dragon and the horse and all that kind of thing on the outside. So it's interesting to me, and I think it has something to do with changes in Buddhist practices, that the mirrors seem to have been linked to astronomical symbolism, and that they started to appear in a major way in Chinese Buddhist art as the same time as a really kind of Indian-based form of astrology was moving into China as part of Buddhist practices. So to push my point as far as I can possibly push it in public, I'm showing you two paintings. One um, is from China. It's the Buddha of Blazing Lights. So I think the ties to mirror are pretty clear. Dated 897 and is one of the great masterpieces from Dunhuang in the British Museum. And the other, which I think structurally is closer to what we've been looking at in the tombs, is what is known as a Hoshi or a star mandala which is a type of imagery that is preserved in Japan pretty much beginning around the 13th century, but which I would like to argue may have its roots in the mirror and astrology that we saw appearing in China around the 11th. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>